We all long for happiness. It's the thing we most dream for. Hail to the altruistic revolution. Let's go for it. Now the first exercise is just going to get us ready for the big finale. Well, thank you very much and thank you for that wonderfully kind introduction. Really happy to be here and see so many happy faces today. <laughs> um, I'm, uh, uh, my name is Richard Ryan and I'm a clinical psychologist, psychotherapist and uh, a motivation researcher. And uh, I've been doing motivation research for uh, a very long time. Um, let me just put this back for a second. I want to say that self-determination theory is really a, a body of work done by a whole community of people across the globe. And it's led to a lot of research and a lot of uh, evidence-based interventions and organizations and clinics and schools and in families. And I'm really happy to be a part of that, in, that movement uh, as it's occurred. And it's been disseminated in a lot of popular books uh, of recent times in many different fields. And you know, clearly in this 15-minute uh, talk, I'm not going to be able to cover a lot of self-determination theory. And one of the things that I just wanted to say right from the outset is to give you an apology. You know, most people, when they think of uh, a motivation researcher is going to speak, they think about motivational speakers. They think, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to say something exciting, inspire you for the next few days. You'll sit on the edge of your seats. Maybe some of you could walk on some hot coals. Um, <laughs> but uh, this is more my style. Uh, I, I'm, a, I'm a numbers person, a scientist. I, I kind of care about what the truth is about uh, the various formulations we have about what brings us to happiness. And I also want to uncover the myths that we also have. And that brings me to the topic that I want to have in uh, uh, today's discussion, which is just about the connection between these two things, which is life goals and happiness. And we all have some life goals. Some of us uh, aspire to be rich and famous. Some of us aspire to be uh, uh, givers to our community. Uh, and one of the things that, uh, that we think very much in self-determination theory is not all life goals pay off with the promise uh, that's offered. So people pursue a lot of life goals, and in pursuing them, they don't get their basic psychological needs fulfilled. And the result of that is they don't get the happiness they hoped for. Whereas other life goals seem to have a greater payoff, and that's what uh, I'd like to discuss just a bit. But I want to say uh, our work in this area uh, is not original. Uh, this question about what kind of life goals, what kind of aspirations we have, and its relationship to happiness goes way back to ancient times, and in particular the work of Aristotle and his concept of eudaimonia. Eudaimonia is roughly translated as living well or really flourishing, and uh, Aristotle argued that... Um, that when, you're, when you have eudaimonia, you're living a life of virtue and of excellence. You're pursuing the things that are really intrinsically worthwhile. And he thought most of us, most of the people around him at the time, didn't get it. In fact, he, he says uh, here that to judge from their lives, most people, and he says, I hear the most vulgar, uh, seem to suppose uh, it to be pleasure, and therefore they favor a life of consumption. And he didn't agree that this was the right way to go in life. He said, in fact, that uh, the people who are happy are those who've cultivated their character and their mind, and they've kept the acquisition of, ex of external goods to moderate limits. But people who are unhappy, and here I quote him again, are those who've managed to acquire more external goods than they can possibly use, but they're lacking in the goods of the soul. And I can't read that second statement without thinking about a lot about my own American culture and how much it actually describes so many people within my culture and now in my fourth year here in Australia to see uh, that being the same for many here too. Now, this was Aristotle's position. It was really an empirical position, not a philosophical one. He was saying that the, the full life, the happy life, would be one where people are pursuing virtues. And, uh, and, and developing their potentialities to the fullest. But not all philosophers have agreed with him, and we have some modern philosophers who, who strongly disagreed. Here's, here's one of them. <laughs> uh, he's a very, very, very prolific uh, author, and uh, has some, some amazing titles like, Have I Told You How Wealthy I Am? I, I, think, he, I think he has. I think he has. Um, but you know, not to give him all the credit for that position, uh, really, we have a lot of cultural messages that are in the same direction. We're told a lot that if we're, we're going to be happy, if we consume the right things, we have the right possessions, if we pursue successful careers, uh, these are going to be the roadways to uh, a good life. 
And so, you know, we have a question here at debate. <laughs> Who's right in this? Is it Aristotle or is it Trump? And I want to point out that, you know, despite their philosophical differences, you do notice the same hairstyle, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so we wanted to address this question empirically as researchers. And, and uh, this is work uh, I really started with Tim Kasser uh, when he was a student at Rochester. And we started this work just by going around uh, to all kinds of groups and asking people, what are your life goals? What are you aspiring to in this life? And uh, there were many different answers to that question, but we found that there were a couple of groups of life goals that kind of went together. And one was a group of goals we called extrinsic life goals. And these are things like making money, getting power, becoming popular or famous, um, uh, having the right image, being attractive in some ways. People who like one of these aspirations typically like the others. They kind of hang together strongly. And uh, another group that we found, though, were people who, when they, you asked them what they wanted to do with their lives, they said, you know, I want loving relationships, or I want to really give to my community, or I want to keep growing and learning. And those things also tended to hang together. So people would tend to favor either intrinsic or extrinsic life goals. And then we would survey people after asking them about their life goals, about their mental health or their wellness. I just want to show you one of our early studies. This is just correlational results. Um, and this was urban adults. We were going door to door and surveying people and asking them about their life goals and then saying, would you fill out this uh, mental health or physical health survey? And we found pretty dramatic results, which is people who were focused on giving to their communities, on relationships, on personal growth, were happier people. They rated themselves as more self-actualized, as having more vitality. They had fewer symptoms of depression. And they had fewer physical complaints like headaches, stomach aches, back aches, uh, typical symptoms of stress. And the opposite was true, of course, for people who were emphasizing extrinsic life goals. They were showing more of these signs of depression, more of these symptoms of stress, and, uh, and, more, and less vitality and energy on a day-to-day -day basis. This, uh, this early research of ours, we did several studies of this sort using different methodologies, and we found that uh, uh, it kept replicating. And there was a New York Times article that wrote about this, calling it the dark side of the American dream. But it's really not just an American issue. We've done uh, now this same research in over 30 nations in the world, and we find the same pattern across all these different cultural groups. Those people who are favoring intrinsic goals in terms of what they're emphasizing as life goals, they turn out to be happier people with fewer uh, mental health uh, problems or uh, issues. And this also was true across ages. We've actually done work with late elementary school children, with teenagers, uh, with working adults, and with retired uh, individuals. And in all these groups, we still get the same pattern of results. Even in occupations where you think the emphasis should be on extrinsic goals, for instance, in business schools, those business students who are more prone to, about, to giving to their community uh, or forming loving relationships turn out to be happier business students as well. So some people questioned, maybe that's not about just the goals that you have, but it's about attainment. So for instance, maybe it's just harder to get rich or it's harder to get famous. And if you got those things, of course you'd be happy. And here I've put up a few rich, famous people on this uh, slide here. And you know, as we know, not all of them are happy people. Some of them might be. And actually what we found in our research is that in life, when people attain extrinsic goals, when they say, I've made that money, I've gotten that fame, uh, I've achieved those things that, uh, that uh, are part of that goal, it doesn't necessarily make them any happier unless they've also had high attainment in intrinsic goals, unless they've established loving families and they've given a lot back to their communities. But people who have given to their communities and people who have loving relationships, if they've attained those things, they're happy whether or not they have exceeded in the extrinsic sphere. So it turns out that success at the intrinsic goals of life is the necessary and sufficient condition for happiness. Now, we've done this, uh, studied this in lots of different ways, but I'll just tell you one more study we did, which was with university students after they graduated. Uh, so a year after they graduated, we followed these people and we asked them, now in your early career stage of life, what are you going after? What are your aspirations? And of course, we had groups who were uh, saying, I want to make money, become famous, get powerful. And we had groups who said, I want to give to my community. I want to form a, a loving family. And what was really interesting in this research is these people who had been able to graduate from universities pretty much got what they wished for. 
over the next two years when we were following them, people who uh, wanted money made more money. People who wanted to get more power got more status. But people who wanted to give their, to their community also gave to their communities and formed more loving relationships. So both groups attained what they were after, but they had very different results in terms of happiness. So in terms of what the change from the baseline when we measured uh, these people, people who were pursuing intrinsic goals and attaining them were actually getting happier, they had more well-being, and they had fewer signs of ill-being over those two years of time. Whereas people who were pursuing extrinsic goals and attaining them, and actually succeeding at them, showed no increase in their happiness or their well-being, and they, but they did show an increase in symptoms of depression, of anxiety, and other forms of ill-being. So, I just want to give you one more example of this, and this is not my research, but it was done by Sheldon and Krieger, and Krieger's a lawyer who's become uh, enamored with uh, self-determination theory, and so he was a big part of this research, and in this research they surveyed lawyers around the United States, I think they had 7,000 lawyers in their sample, and they separated them into three groups. One group was a group of uh, lawyers who they called social advocacy lawyers, and these are people who went into law with some intrinsic goals in their hearts. They wanted to uh, work for the protection of the environment, or they wanted to work against social injustice, or provide services for the poor. And they formed, you know, about a third of this large group of lawyers. Another group, though, was what they called the money lawyers. And this was a large group of lawyers who really went into the profession because they were going to make the big bucks. And they tended to work for hedge funds, or they worked for corporations, probably defending against the environmental regulations that the social advocacy lawyers were working for. Uh, but they were in there for the money. And they got, like our college graduates, they got what they wished for. This group of money lawyers was substantially better off financially than the social advocacy lawyers. But remarkably, when it came to the richness of happiness, the richness of well-being, it is the uh, social advocacy people who were significantly higher. Not controlling for income, because if you control for income, it would only exaggerate that result greatly. So they were unhappy, and a kind of a sad part of the, uh, the money lawyer scenario is that in their unhappiness on a day-to-day -day basis, because they're not pursuing something that they have high purpose for or high mission, uh, they felt a lot of stress and a lot of pressure, and the way they tried to solve that problem is buy more things maybe another vacation home, maybe a second Mercedes, maybe that will now make me happy. But that's a vicious cycle that added nothing to their overall happiness. So this pattern is, is a pretty clear pattern to this point, and, and sadly it describes a lot of cultural movements too. And so I mentioned here a, a study by Jeannie Twang and her uh, associates where they were looking at a 70 year uh, span of entering college students and their mental health in the United States. And they found a disturbing trend. Uh, they found that entering college students over the 70-year period were in, in, increasing in their reports of antisocial attitudes and behaviors, and they were increasing in their signs of depression over time. And Twenge and her colleagues tried to see what could account for this linear trend towards more psychopathology, and what they found is that it wasn't accounted for by changes in religion, it wasn't accounted for by changes in family structure, it was not predicted by economic trends within the society, Instead, they concluded the, the following, because they saw it was really a change in values. They said it fit a cultural pattern of change toward extrinsic rather than intrinsic goals. And more specifically, they said, over time, American cultures increasingly shifted to an environment where more and more young people experience poor mental health and psychopathology, possibly due to an increased focus on money, appearance, and status, rather than community and relationships. This is even true in our retirement and old age. This is a, a study that was done in Belgium by uh, Martin van Stinkisch and van Heil of people who were 75 years uh, on average in age. And they asked them, what have you attained in your life? And they uh, took their extrinsic attainments, and the extrinsic attainments turned out, uh, as you can see here, not to be associated with well-being, where people saying, I had intrinsic attainments, was robustly associated with greater well-being. But more than that, too, people who uh, had attained extrinsic uh, outcomes in life, this didn't add to their uh, sense of uh, ego integrity. It, uh, it didn't add to their, uh, it didn't take away from their despair. And you can see here that it was associated with less acceptance of death that's coming. So even in old age, when we look back on what's been important in our lives, 
we see that it's really uh, more about the intrinsic than extrinsic goals. So, you know, this, is, this has been, I know this is a happiness conference and I'm giving a kind of depressing message. And, uh, I apologize for that. I, you know, uh, the message has been so far that pursuing wealth, money, and, and fame won't, won't get you there. Uh, pursuing love, pursuing community will. And so when we get to what you should do, I, I just want to, in my last couple minutes here, uh, emphasize a couple things. One is the intrinsic value of personal growth. When we think about that, we think about uh, pursuing the things that are re really meaningful, both in your vocations and your avocations, like the social advocacy lawyers, going for something that has a purpose. You always also, I think, it's looking for novelty and always wanting to learn. Uh, Auntie Rhonda, who I was in the green room in the back, she said, you know, take a new pathway every day. I really like that idea. That's, that's adding to personal growth. And when you do that personal growth, of course, it's adding to your basic psychological need satisfaction, and this will increase uh, your wellness overall. Secondly, relationships is another intrinsic goal, and you know, this is the most universally rated important goal uh, in all the cultures we study, and really, it's the most important contributor to overall life satisfaction. And I can't emphasize this enough, how strong the results are in all of our data for giving to your community and how it fosters well-being. We've done lots of studies of helping, lots of studies of contributing, and why it makes people happy or in what ways it does. And when you give to others, you're doing several things that satisfy what in SDT we call basic psychological needs. When you're giving to others and helping others, you can help, that helps you to feel effectiveness uh, or competence in the world. It helps you connect with other people and feel that relatedness, and it also fulfills that sense of mission and value so important to our sense of autonomy. So this turns out to be a very important way uh, to happiness, so to speak, and uh, it's no wonder to us then that people like to do good, because when they do good, not because they're trying to do this, uh, but they also turn out to do well for themselves. So, you know, in summary, I just wanna say that, you know, it's been a long debate, uh, thousands of years now, and you know, we see that uh, when it comes down to the, the data anyway, some ancient ho truths are still holding true, which is it's the intrinsic goals that really matter. Thank you very much.